Okay, we're going to be starting in about five minutes, so just hang in there with me. Okay, so we're starting to get uh, some people arriving here. So I'm going to give everyone a little bit of time to get settled in. And sometimes the first time they come to the live training, it takes them a while to figure out how to get in here. So just hang in there and we'll be starting shortly. All right, so as you're uh, viewing the screen there, you should have a question and answer area to the right where you can click and type a question. So go ahead and type your name in so I can see it, see who's here and welcome you to the uh, class. All right, so I like to start right on time. Even though there's only a few of us here, we are gonna get going and uh, welcome to the uh, schematic reading part one. If you are one of my students, this is part of your training. And this also, if you're not one of my students and you're a guest, then this is what we do from time to time with the online HVAC training is do, to, to do some live training and then this gets recorded and broken up into separate parts and then put into the tr training curriculum for those students who could not attend. I, I do have some in Australia and Alaska and the Western part of Canada. So sometimes the time frame doesn't work. So tonight we are going to get into reading basic schematic diagrams. And we're gonna cover probably from schematic symbols. And I'm going to try and get to maybe here. It just depends on how we go. If you're not familiar with schematics, this is a lot to absorb and a lot to get your head wrapped around. And I don't want to rush through it. We have plenty of time to do this. And if it takes five parts to get it right, then we'll do five, five part series. And, and if it takes 10, we'll do 10. 
So we're going to get started with that. Also, to let you know, this is our new presentation whiteboard here. So we're testing this out to see how this integrates with the live streaming. And this is a preliminary test before we do live streaming from a real classroom with a whiteboard and multiple camera angles. So if we can pull that off, um, I'd be very excited to have that happen. So let's start. Again, this is for my HVAC technician course. So if you're an HVAC te technician already, you're familiar with some of this, but just to give you a quick brief, the schematic diagrams that uh, you'll find are almost always on the inside cover of the of the equipment that you're working on, whether it be a rooftop system or a residential system. So if the outdoor unit, you take the cover off to the electrical panel over here, it, uh, it will have a some type of schematic diagram and the same with the indoor unit. And if you're lucky, train sometimes has service facts, which has even more information for you. And if you're unlucky, then this will be completely destroyed and you're going to have to re rely on chasing wires to do it. So when we get done with our schematic diagram training, you're going to be able to take an, a look at this and read it like a roadmap and understand everything that's going on here. Now, I know this seems very intimidating right now, but once we get done and we go through this, then you're going to get the hang of it. And by the end, we'll be going, we'll be stepping through this and drawing through this and developing this diagram to show you how to read it. So these schematic diagrams and ladder diagrams and pictorial diagrams all help you take this right here and make sense of it. So this is the inside of a Lennox heat pump. And this is the cover. So what you're looking at here is represented in the nice little roadmap here to help you figure out what's happening without having to take and follow this yellow wire to wherever it goes. You can see where it goes from the schematic diagram. It makes it much easier if you know how to, to read this than trying to chase those wires. A couple of things that we need to know for schematic diagrams. And that is open and closed or make made circuits make or break. So let's look at this circuit right here. This switch is closed. So so it's what we call made. This switch is open. And that's what we call break. So it's a make or break, closed or open, however you want to do it. So if you hear those terms, um, make or break that's what they're talking about opened or closed okay the the other thing all all of the schematic diagrams and every electrical circuit that you're going to be working with consist of power line switch and a load so this is the previous uh, miniature schematic diagram. So when we're talking about power, we're talking about input power, whether it be from a battery, but usually it is from uh, your wall outlet or the disconnect switch on the equipment. That's your power coming in from the circuit breaker panel. The line refers to the wiring in the circuit. And then, you, of course, you have a switch, and there's different kinds of switches in our in our equipment, but whatever type of switch it is, there always will be at least one. And then we have what's called the load. The load in this instance is a is the is the fan motor. And loads are the part of the equipment that do the work. So if it's a light bulb, that's the load. If it's a heat, an electric strip heater, that's the load. If it's a fan ceiling fan that's the load and every circuit in your house has power line switch and load same thing with every every piece of equipment hvac equipment that you'll be running work running into okay so when we're talking about this power line switch and load 
those are the only three, th four things that can go wrong with a circuit. No matter how complex, every, every circuit in HVAC equipment has power line switch and load. So think about this. Here's our fan motor right here. And that fan motor is running. Our switch is closed or made right here. So this fan motor is running. It's got all four of the components it needs to run and it's operating properly. If this switch is open or it burns out, the fan motor stops running. If this wire breaks, the fan motor stops running. If the power stops being applied, the fan motor stops running. And if the fan motor burns out, the fan motor stops running. So there's four, only four things that can go wrong with a circuit. It doesn't have the power it needs. The, the line or the wires are broken or corroded. The switch is either not closed or burned out or the load is has failed. So that's it. So now you have to just figure out what, uh, what part of the circuit is what based on the schematic diagram. And then it's a matter of checking power, the line, the switches and the load. Okay, series circuits. Let's talk about that a little bit. We'll, we'll let, and we're gonna talk about the, line, the power line switch and load. So in a schematic diagram, L1 and L2 refer to incoming power. And this happens to be 208 volts. So let's look at this. So L1 and L2, that's our power. Here is our line. And here's, and we're gonna learn about these switches here in just a bit. But these are switches that are made. So that one's made, that one's made, this one's made. So we have our switches and then we have a load and we have our electric motor will be running based on the schematic diagram. Now in a series circuit, if any of the switches open up, that switch opens or that switch opens or this switch opens, the electric motor stops. So in our HVAC equipment, the switches are all in series are all in a line. And there's a lot of times they are safeties and overload protection that if there's a high pressure situation, it'll stop the motor, a low pressure situation stops the motor and then some controls over here. And all of those controls for an individual load are wired in series, which means any one of those that opens or breaks stops that load from, from running. Just move on here. Here's here is another series circuit, and these are very simple series circuit. But again, line, power, switch, and load. Now parallel circuits. Remember, I said that all in in the series circuits will have the line, and we'll have some switches, and then there'll be one load. In HVAC equipment, all of the loads need to be connected to the power, to the line and the power coming in in parallel. That means they're, on, they're like rungs of a ladder. This is a very simple, this is a very simple diagram. The reason that, the, first of all, that they're connected in parallel is that if this light bulb burns out, it doesn't stop the fan motor or the compressor or the heater from running. If this fan motor burns out, it doesn't stop the other components from running. The other reason is, is if these are all in series, um, they start to, all of them start to draw more voltage and current. And you get down to the end, they all end up trying to split the power between the four of them. So all of the loads have to be in parallel, like the rungs of a ladder. Now the schematic diagrams, Sometimes ladder diagrams will show it in this, in this configuration. Other times they don't, but you just need to know if, if it's a load, it is always in parallel to another load and the loads usually do not affect each other as far as operation goes. Okay, so let's look at a very simple series parallel circuit 
we won't worry about this right now but let's this is more of how the equipment is hooked up so we have our power coming in l1 and l2 and we have our line this is our electric um, wiring here we have our switches here and and then there's our loads this is our condenser fan motor the um, contactor yeah another condenser fan motor and a compressor so each one of these circuits are independent of each other so here is one complete power line switch and load here is another power line switches and loads and here's another leg and the contactor is a switch loads in parallel here two loads in this rung so there what we're looking at here are three individual complete circuits but they're all kind of wired together so and that's what makes schematic diagrams um, difficult so that just kind of gives you an idea about series and parallel circuits and then remember con the controls are in series are in line with the loads so there this is a series circuit from here to here and then all the loads are in parallel with each other so if you have a condenser fan motor number two is not running um, you're not worried about the uh, contactor over here the condenser fan motor number one or the compressor affecting that because loads are always in parallel with each other it's always either your power or your or your switches but we'll get into that in more detail here in later in later uh, lessons okay so when we this is pretty this is a pretty simple schematic diagram but not as simple as this one but when you get done, you're going to be able to look at this and go, oh, gosh, I know what's going on. I know how this runs and what this means and so forth. So there is hope when we get done, we'll revisit this and then we'll see if you can step through it. There's quite a few common schematic symbols. You can download these from the Internet. There is no real standard right now for schematic symbols. They're trying to go to that. Each manufacturer has a little bit different way of um, indicating and, and, and putting their schematic symbols in their diagrams. So you just have to become familiar with the generic and basic ones. And then over time, you'll get to learn that. And I, I think eventually what will happen is the schematic symbols and schematic diagrams will be more standardized. Okay, so loads. We talked about loads. That's, that's what does the work. That is why we have um, everything else in the equipment is to make the motor turns to make the compressor run to turn the fan to turn on the heaters or to um, take a coil and make a switch switch an electric switch turn on and off so when we're talking about loads we're talking about those things that consume a lot of power do a lot of work and they're all wired in parallel to each other so loads most of the time we were talking about motors and first of all so here here and here are our motors and here's some schematic symbols that you might see so this is a condenser fan motor with its wiring coming in and out this is a an evapor evaporator fan motor or blower motor and a compressor motor you may also see it in other schematic diagrams looking looking like this or looking like this not to worry i'll show you how you're going to identify those here in just a bit all right so motors <clears throat> excuse me are either going to be a, a round circle with a designator in in them and there will be a legend that tells you what that cfm stands for efm and compressor again all met the manufacturers identify these differently so you have to go to the legend to, sh to see what these little terms stand for okay solenoid valve this is a schematic symbol for a solenoid valve you're going to find these in 
ice machines. You're going to find them in commercial refrigeration equipment. You'll find them in residential equipment when the uh, outdoor unit is on the ground and the air handler is three stories high. And it is basically an um, el electronic valve and the solenoid valve will open and close based on the signal that's sent to its coil. So it's got a magnetic coil and when power is applied, it opens and closes this valve and it either lets refrigerant flow through or stops it when it's closed or it'll let water flow through depending on, on the circuit that it's involved in. But this is the schematic diagram for a solenoid valve. And you see on this diagram, we have a legend that tells us that SOL equals solenoid coil. And the coil is what energizes this valve and makes it open and close. A lot of the coils, and we'll see later on, any magnetically operated switch or valve has this symbol to show that that's a magnetic um, coil that opens and closes based on the uh, signal applied to it. Heaters. So in, in HVAC, we have, this happens to be an electric strip heater from an electric uh, furnace. There are duct heaters, there are supplementary heaters, there are crankcase heaters, there are um, heaters and small sensing devices and so forth. And basically, this is a, just about the universal symbol for a, any type of heater. And this just indicates a heater coil here. So this is a, this could indicate this heater right here. And the crankcase heater is a smaller heater that heats up the compressor. And it looks different, but it is still a, a heater. So you apply power to the heater and it just warms up. All right. So the, this is also a load. Okay, contactors and relays. You're going to find that these are probably the most confusing items on a schematic diagram. And we're going to uh, look in depth at contactors and relays before we get too much further here. So contactors and relays are, are switches but they are also a little bit of a load because when power is applied, it's got a magnetic coil that uh, activates and deactivates this contacts inside that contactor to turn on and off equipment. And the, and the way this works is you can have a low voltage from your thermostat coming into the, the coil of the contactor, and that's low voltage that's safe. You can have small wires that the homeowner takes his thermostat out off, he's not going to get zapped with it. And you can have 200 volts that is switched through this, this contactor itself controlled by a lower voltage. On contactors, there's a couple different components and some of them have more than just these. The first thing is a contactor coil. And that can be indicated in this schematic diagram and symbol with the circle. And this one doesn't have a legend, but sometimes it'll have a C and then down in the legend will C equals contact or coil. It also can have a, this little symbol right here that indicates the coil. And also in the, the newer equipment, just like the solenoid valve, that coil is going to have this symbol as well. So you could have one, two, three different symbols, meaning it's the same part of the contactor, which is the magnetic coil. When you apply power, it opens and closes the switches and contacts in the, in the coil. All right, you got it? All right, so this is, these are our, the, the magnetic coils. These are the contacts or the switches up here that are activated by the coil. So there are two types of contacts that you have on contactors. NO, which means normally open, and C means normally closed. What that means is when there is no power, 
that's applied to the contactor coil, this is what these contacts, the state that these contacts are in. No power applied to the coil. If this is contact one and contact two, it, it's open. And if this is contact three and this is contact four, no power, remember, that's a closed switch and an open switch basically is what you're looking at. No power applied. Now here's where it gets difficult because the schematic diagrams always show you contactors and relays in their resting position, which means no power applied. But when you flip a, the thermostat on and it supplies power to this coil, all of a sudden this normally open contact switch is closed and the normally closed contact switch is open. Now you can't see that on the schematic diagram. So that's where you have to know, who do I have power here at the coil of the contactor? Yes, then mentally you have to close that normally open switch and open the normally closed switch. Does that make sense? Let me do that one more time because I can't see, I can't see your faces to see if you're shaking your head yes or no. And I also can't see the um, question and the answer box to see if there's any questions. But when we get done with contactors, with just this part, I'll, I'll pop back. If you have any questions up to, up to here so far, um, I'll get those answered before we move on. So let's go over this one more time. Contactor coils. There could be three different symbols. You have to look at your legend to find out what they are. There, then there's the contacts. They're normally open contacts, normally Closed contacts. This is the is is how it is diagrammed on your schematics when there is no power applied to the coil and it's at rest. So if you just pulled it off the shelf, disconnected from anything, off your truck shelf, this contact here and this contact here are open, or that and that's a switch basically, and this contact here and this contact here are closed. When you ap apply power to any of the coils, however they're designated on the schematic, it changes that normally open contact to, a nor to closed and the normally closed contact to open. So you gotta remember that, don't get confused. That's a hard part about contactors. All right, let me pop back and see if there's any questions so far. All right, so I'm going to pop up the question and answer box. Hopefully you can see that question and answer box on the right side of your screen. So do you have any questions so far before we move forward? And there is a delay here a bit, so I'll give you a chance. Sometimes it's, it can be up to a minute or so. So I'll give us a few minutes, a, a minute or two for any questions that may pop up should be over here on the right hand side of your screen. If you roll your mouse over there, you should be able to uh, ask a question. Again, we're trying out some new, we're trying out some new integration and technology here. So bear with me. Okay, so far so good. So we have no questions on contactors. So we're going to move forward then. We're going to go probably another 15 minutes and stop probably right after contactors, see if there's any questions. We have, a, I'm thinking we're going to have a, probably six parts to the schematic, schematics class. So there's no, again, there's no need to rush. All right, let's move forward. Here's another uh, example of the uh, de-energized and energized contactor. So let's look at this again. Here is the uh, contactor coil. It's de-energized, meaning that there's no power applied to the coil. The contact number three is normally closed. One or two are normally open. When we apply power to the coil, three now is open and one and two close. All right. Again, de-energized is how it is on the schematic diagram. And then when you're doing your troubleshooting, you need to measure voltage and see if you have power here. And then 
mentally open and close these switches because it doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen for you on the schematic. Again, here is another diagram. So let's look at this. This is a little bit better representation. So right now the thermostat is open. This circuit is at rest. So there's no power applied to the fan relay. And remember that I told you there's the, the little zigzag symbol right there. Fan relay, no power applied. So there's our normally open contact. So that switches the power to the fan motor. So right now the fan motor's not on, it's off. And there's our normally closed contact and the light is on. So this is at rest. So then the thermostat closes, it makes this circuit. And we apply power to the fan relay right here. The schematic diagram doesn't change, but the physically the circuit does. This normally open contact closes, the fan motor is running, and then the normally closed contact opens. So that looks like this mentally. That's what you have to do. And the fan off light goes out. Can you see that? And again, this is a pretty simple schematic diagram of a contactor, and I'm going to show you where it really gets confusing, and we'll probably go over this a couple dozen more times before we get through with this. And we're going to talk about some of these other switches that control things here in a bit, probably in the next lesson. Okay, so this is a contactor, and this is a schematic diagram, and this is what makes them difficult in the field and when you're dealing with not the textbook schematics but with real schematics and and this is why the contactor physically is one complete piece of uh, one complete part here but when you look at it on the schematic diagram and and again we're going to we'll look at this in a little bit more detail later. We'll, we'll break this down later, but let's just look at the contactor. So here's our contactor coil here on the schematic diagram, which is the two wires coming in right here, the magnetic part of it. This part of the contactor is up here and normally open on the schematic diagram. This is a straight through bus bar on the contactor. And it is here on the schematic diagram. So while you're looking at the equipment and this contactor and it's all one complete piece physically on the schematic diagram, it's, it's scattered about in three different places. And if it's a relay that has more than one set of contacts on it, it could be scattered in four or five different places on that on that diagram. So you really need to, especially with the contactors, understand that the coil diagram and, and the symbol for the coil is always, not I wouldn't say always, but 99% of the time, physically separated on the schematic diagram from the contacts. And a lot of times those contacts as well are just about as far apart as they can be here on the schematic diagram. Okay, do you see that? That's what makes them difficult. And then the other thing that makes them difficult is you've got to switch those switches in your, in your mind when you have power applied to the coil of the thermostat and you have 24 volts applied here and the, the magnetic coil energizes, then it closes that switch and energizes the compressor. All right. And okay, we'll do a couple more, couple more um, switches while we're at it. <clears throat> These are temperature controlled switches. And I'm going to get back to this. This is a, it says heating thermostat here, but it's not always a heating thermostat. This diagram right here indicates the 
switch opens when the temperature increases. So you have, and, and this will make more sense, and, and we'll come back to this. This will make more sense in just a little bit. So that's how that works. When the temperature increases, it, it expands this little symbol right here. This is a temperature controlled device when you see that, and it expands and pushes that open. And also conversely, if the temperature falls to a certain point, this is gonna come back down and close that switch. So this is open on temperature rise. So it will go, it moves in that direction as the temperature goes up and it closes when the temperature falls. The other thing that gets confusing with this is you might see this diagram that looks like this in, in a schematic diagram. This is hard to draw with. Okay, so if you see this, this, this symbol in a schematic diagram, this means it's normally open. And then if the temperature, if the temperature falls, it makes that switch, but it could also be a normally closed temperature switch, which will open when the temperature rises. I know it's kind of confusing, but we'll look at the, that again but you can see it both in the open and closed position on the schematic diagram. But you just need to know that as temperature goes up, this opens, as temperature goes down, it closes. And, they, and temperature switches have different ranges in which they open and close. And then here is a, let me cross that out. This is a close on temperature rise, which closes the switch when the temperature increases and opens the switch when the temperature decreases. These little symbols right here will make a little bit more sense in just a bit, but I want you to picture as the temperature increases, this little symbol accordions out and pushes that contact close. And then it shrinks back down and pulls back down like a kind of like a spring when um, the temperature falls. Okay, so here are a couple of temperature actuated switches that you might find. And there, there's quite a few different ones. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a temperature limit switch that you would see on a gas furnace or an electric furnace that opens on a temperature rise. And usually these switches are used for safeties. If something gets too hot, it's gonna open up and break that circuit. So um, in this switch, if it gets too warm, this is going to break open the circuit and disable whatever it is controlling. Here's another one, same thing. And this is manually reset. Some of them re will reset when the temperature comes down, but this is one that pops and you have to manu manually reset it. That's a safety switch for sure if you have to reset it. Here's another one. This is this goes in the heat exchanger of a gas furnace. And this is the uh, one that changes temperature and it controls the defrost on a heat pump. So temperature controlled switches, you could have several of them in just one piece of equipment. So this is how this works. Inside all of these in one form of a nut or another that doesn't look like this. This is for illustration purposes only. But there are two different metals. In this one, we have brass and steel. And then we have our we have our line coming in here. And here's our electrical contacts. That's our little switch. And you have to picture that this this is not just hanging in space over here. This is mounted inside that. Uh, temperature controlled switch. So this is a this is mounted in the station area right here. And we have a bimetal strip that has um, it's fixed on one side. And what happens when you have two different types of metals, they expand at different rates based on temperature. So when the 
temperature changes from its design closed contact position and temperature as the temperature changes let's say it's warmed up and this is it's getting hotter and hotter this bimetal strip begins to warp and and it will warp out and eventually break those contacts right there and turn off whatever it's controlling with these wires right here whatever that's connected to is going that circuit breaks and turns off whatever device that it is a safety for or it or it stops the defrost on the on a heat pump so that's how that works is a bimetal strip and it doesn't look like this inside of there but that is a good representation of what happens the one thing to know is these are not instantaneous there's a little bit of a travel time here so this might this might break at 100 degrees fahrenheit break open but then it then this has got as things cool this metal's got to to come back to shape and straight up and down to make that contact and it might be 80 degrees that it closes so there's a a little bit of a uh, lag there and temperature lag between the opening and closing a lot of times on the on them it will sit it'll say 100 dash 80 which means it it breaks at 100 and and makes it 80 so you'll you'll get to learn that and we'll discuss that a little bit in another class all right so so now this is where this makes a little bit more sense this indicates our bimetal strip right here so as it heats up it it pushes those contacts apart in this one and as this one heats up it pushes them closed and as it cools that bimetal strip bends back closes this one this one bends back and opens up hopefully that makes a little bit more sense to you no matter what type of switch it is this symbol indicates a temperature controlled switch and again this shows the normal whenever you see them they're in the nor their normal position and you you just need to know that what the uh, temperature is that these make and break at so you can determine physically what's happening because the schematic diagram again just shows it in its normal position a okay, transformer this is where we take in uh, we have our 240 volts in and it drops it down to 24 volts for our control voltage that is just about the universal symbol for a transformer. You may not see this little line in between of, in between it, but these these again are in every piece of equipment that you're going to run into. So it's usually 240 volts in, 24 volts out, or 120 volts in on the gas furnace, and 24 volts out. Pressure switches. A couple different kinds of pressure switches. This happens to be for commercial refrigeration here. Sometimes you'll use them for fan controls. This is what you're going to see most often on residential equipment. It's just basically a uh, it screws on to the pressure port of the refrigeration lines, and then it makes or breaks based on the pressure of the uh, the design pressure of the switch. Same thing here as the temperature controlled switch. This is the indication of a pressure switch. When you see it like in this in this orientation, as the pressure increases, it pushes that switch open. As it decreases, that switch will close. Same thing on this one. This is close on rise in pressure. So if the pressure is pushing up on that little cup, and at the design closing pressure, this switch will be closed. As the pressure falls, it, it eases up that pressure on that little cup and it will open up that switch. Once again, there's, they're only in one position on the um, schematic diagram. In most HVAC equipment, the pressure switches 
residential HVAC equi equipment, I should say, the pressure switches are safety devices. So they are normally closed. And if the pressure in the system gets too high, it's going to pop that switch open and stop everything to pr protect the compressor. Same thing if we get the pressures get too low, it's going to pop it open right here and uh, stop the equipment to pr protect the compressor. Misters, we're going to see these more and more with the with equipment that is of higher efficiencies and more complex. These are small devices that change resistance with temperature. They're connected to control boards and the control board uh, microprocessor and brains are going to make something happen based on the resistance of this thermistor. Most of the time they are strapped to our refrigeration piping. They may be um, wedged into the coils. The outdoor temperature sensor sometimes is just dangling in the outdoor air. The thermistors that have a positive temperature coefficient, as the temperature increases, the resistance increases on the on that thermistor. A negative temperature coefficient thermistor as temperature decreases, resistance increases. Now, almost all manufacturers will have their um, breakdown of the thermistor and, or you can get it from them. So if it's, for example, if it's seven is in a 75 degree condition, it's going to read 1500 ohms. That's, and then if it's 80, on a positive temperature coefficient, it might read 1570 ohms. I'll do, I'll do a, uh, I'll do a separate video on thermistors and do some uh, resistance measurements and show you the chart from that. But this is the schematic symbol for a thermistor. And there are others, but this is a pretty common one. It looks pretty similar to a heater and a coil and everything else. The key here is you got to look at that um, little T on this one or whatever symbol is on here. You're going to have to go to the legend and and figure out what this diagram represents. But that's a thermistor. It's a device that changes resistance based on temperature. OK, let's look at the legend. I think then we're going to call it quits. So here is a legend. You'll find them on every schematic diagram. And took this one, this part of the legend right here and blew it up. So what you would do is IF is the indoor fan motor. So you're going to be looking on the schematic diagram for IF and there it is. Right there. IFR is indoor fan relay. Here it is right here, indoor fan relay. Remember I said relays are difficult because they are scattered in the schematic. Well, look at this. Let's see, we have indoor fan relay right there. Where else is it? Let's see if there's another one here. Nope, that's it. That's it for that. Here's our contactor, M. Where is that? That's the coil. These are the round symbol. Remember, those are the coils. Now we have to find the contacts for M. So you got to go through here and start to look. And oh, there's there's one of contact from the uh, contactor. And here's the other, normally open contacts. When power is applied to the coil, those close. Clean this up a bit. OK, let's look at high and low pressure switch, HP and LP. So you look through here. Oh, there they are right there. HP, LP, normally closed. If the pressure increases, it's going to break that switch. If the pressure decreases, 
it's going to break this switch. So these are our safeties here. So you will have, depending on the complexity of the schematic diagram, you're going to have uh, legends could be very big. See if we can identify a few other things. Here is a uh, temperature, close on temperature rise switch. Oh, overloads. We'll have to get, we'll, we'll talk about overload on the next. No, we can talk about that right now. Overloads. Usually the overloads are inside the equipment. These, this symbol right here. So it looks like a little shepherd's hook deal. Let's see if I can draw that. like that. These are overloads and they, these will break when you get too much current going through there. They, again, I think this, this is a very difficult one to picture, but when the current flows through there, it, it heats up those contacts and those, those, those um, hooks there, the uh, shepherd's hook looking thing, you just have to picture those contracting away from each other and breaking the circuit when they get too hot. Great words for technical, right? Shepherd hook looking things, but you get the picture. Okay, so we made it to the end of part one. Let's pop back here, see if there's any questions at all. Okay. Oh, there we go. So we got the question box going. Okay, well, Mark, okay, so Doug, good, you got it on there. Any questions, Mark? Um, don't worry, this will be in our class um, in its entirety for you to watch in a couple days. Let's see, is 24 volts AC standard in home air conditioning units? Yes, it is. And uh, almost all, all units, including boilers, gas fired furnaces, oil fire, fired furnaces, Commercial, commercial, uh, light commercial equipment uses the 24 volt controls with the 24 volt transformer. Uh, thermistors, Mark, you asked about the um, placing them on like a uh, bulb. No. Okay, so Mark asked about do we place thermistors like the bulb on a TXV? I think what is asking, and um, no, that is those aren't as sensitive to, well, they are as sensitive, but it's not as critical. And they are mounted just about anywhere on that pipe and they change so, the resistance changes so little based on the temperature. They're pretty pretty precise there. So no, it, you'll find them anywhere, mounted anywhere they need, they are, they can be from 12 o'clock all the way around. Okay, let me see. I'm gonna I gotta mark these questions as being answered. I don't know how to do that yet. Okay. Oh, are you guys having trouble reading the schematic diagrams? Can you, I, no, I see you mentioned that down there. Again, this is this is new technology. If I need to make these schematic diagrams bigger or chunk them up to make it a little bit easier. Or maybe uh, when we get to the big ones, what I'll do is scan them, put them in a PDF format. You can download them and then you can get some colored pencils out and start scribbling along with me. Any other questions? There is a bit of a delay here. So again, I'm just going to, to hang out and see if anybody has any questions well, let me scroll down here. Okay, Mark, go take go take care of the fire. Mark's a, Mark has got a fire and has to go. Okay, any more questions? So we there's only a couple of people asking questions, but we have several more people viewing. Okay, now, Doug, I know you're not to the schematic part yet, but, but by the time we get through this and you get to it, you'll be an expert at it.
and and there's more to cover we'll cover more uh we'll, we will cover more components in shorter videos together this is assuming you know what these components actually do in the system but we'll cover those as well All right, guys, last chance here to ask questions. If you have any questions and and you're a student in the class, just post them on the class forum. And if you're a guest that's been invited tonight, you can go ahead and email me at uh, hbactrainingsolutions at gmail.com. All right, guys, thanks for attending. I'll keep you posted on our next class, and I hope to see you there.